Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. I can see you all, or most of you. My name is Nick Gowing. Um, I don't really have to thank you for being here because you're all so delighted to be here, uh, to be recognized um, uh, the, the new champion uh, communities. That's the aim of uh, this next hour, the six new champion communities. And my job is to make this fun for you for the next hour, uh, along with those representing uh, uh, what you've all achieved. There are 500 of you, actually, but I don't think there are 500 here tonight. Uh, all of you, and you love to hear this, you're forward-looking, you're cutting-edge leaders. Uh, my job is to impress you and make you feel um, tremendous for being here, really. Let me tell you that age is not a requirement. You can be a young champion you can be an old champion. You can be a very old champion or a very young champion. Age is not an issue. Uh, and all of you are really well on your way to pioneering uh, new technology, uh, new business models, new solutions for the new global challenges. And I think we have to add their uncertainties in this very uh, difficult world at the moment. Uh, you've taken risks, uh, you've innovated, and you're here because you've succeeded. Uh, we're spotlighting really a new generation of entrepreneurs um, who are pioneering a new course for growth. Not maybe what you thought of when you set out uh, on this path, but that's the way you're being recognized here uh, this evening in Dalian. And you're redefining what it means really to be entrepreneurs in uh, this world. And there are probably others who are not here from the current generation of entrepreneurs who've got a lot to learn from you. Your people, um, whether famous or not, who are paving the path for others to follow. Pioneers, you're changing the paradigm for business um, through your model that you've developed, your disruptive technology, or even creating new markets at the same time. And in many ways, you've begun to change the world or you are changing the world um, at local, regional, or global level in a new and positive way and you've all got inspiring stories to share. Now, if any of you reckon, don't recognize yourselves here, you're in the wrong place. But I think all of you do. Uh, we're delighted to see you. Maybe I could just have a little more light so I can see who I'm talking to, uh, which would be great. Now, I've got to recognize that 500 of you, many of you here sitting in front of me, all of you could have been up here on the platform, but as you can see, we can really only have five up here. We could have had 50 chairs, but it would have got rather crowded and it would have lasted all night, probably. And then right at the end, we will have a joint photograph taken here on the stage to prove that you've all been here officially. Um, uh, who are the new champions? Uh, let me invite those five representatives onto the stage in a moment. Let me underline the, the, the qualities that these panelists are really representing, what they're showcasing. They're showcasing vision, risk-taking, persevering, convening, and adaptability. <laughs> Who will chart the future? Those who see in a new way. We actually develop a, a sensor that measures your gaze movement. So you can actually control a computer using your eyes only. It measures your eyes position in space and where they're pointing, thus creating a machine that knows what you're paying attention to. We see endless possibilities within gaming, in cars, just making your computers understand you better. Those who empower us to do more. I'm David Kingham, Chief Executive of Tokamak Energy, and we're pursuing a unique approach to the development of fusion power. What we're aiming to do is to use spherical tokamaks with high temperature superconducting magnets to make rapid progress towards that elusive goal of electricity from fusion. And we're aiming to do that to the point of producing electricity for the first time within 10 years. Those who design new ways of working We have to think now about how, how do we grow in a way that's socially sustainable and environmentally sustainable as well as economically sustainable. And so in a sense there's an opportunity to reinvent everything, redesign everything. That's both incredibly exciting and pretty challenging. Those who give a voice to the masses. If we want to change this country, we absolutely have to count on youth and work on involvement of youth in the Tunisian politics. This is the laboratory of democracy in the Arab world. And if it succeeds here, it will give 
a huge hope to the other countries to succeed. Future growth will be generated by you, the champions of today. Cracking wicked puzzles, changing the status quo, questioning the unquestioned, spurring global growth, improving people's livelihoods. As a society, as a community and as the world, we need to have difficult conversations if we are to overcome the problems. There's no point going out there and thinking we can change the world in a day. Uh, we have to start small, we have to think locally, we have to think about our cities first, then talk about our states, then as a group forum be able to implement it globally. With that excitement that people are coming together to really work on these problems, you know, brilliant minds, um, really experienced people are coming together to solve some of the world's most challenging problems. It's simply one of the most remarkable groups of people that I've ever interacted with, and yet actually having their feet to the ground. New champions, charting a new course for growth. So welcome to you all. It's good to see you. Now, uh, as I say, highlighting uh, all of you uh, are the five colleagues of yours, and let me introduce them one by one. Andrew Fersman, uh, let me invite you up here, uh, first of all, from uh, Vancouver in British Columbia in Canada, Chief Executive Officer of 1QB Information Technologies. Welcome, Andrew. Uh, we'll be hearing more about you in a moment. Uh, Christine Richmond uh, from the United States. Uh, welcome, Christine, uh, co-founder and Chief Executive Officer of Revolution Foods, a young global leader and a social entrepreneur. We'll be coming to you first in a moment. Then to Helen High, uh, who joins us, uh, having done some remarkable work uh, in Ethiopia and across Africa. Goodwill Ambassador and United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO. Uh, you're from Shanghai, a young global leader. Leslie Mazdorp, who's uh, joining us from South Africa, but he's now uh, based in Shanghai, and uh, only very recently has he gone there. Uh, welcome, Leslie, Vice President of the New Development Bank here in the PRC. And finally, Zhang Tai, uh, who has a remarkable record as a uh, developer, a founder and chief executive of Jinping here in the PRC. More details about that. Welcome to all five of you. Now, what I want to do um, is give you all a kind of pen portrait idea of why they're sitting here in their own words. And what I'm going to do is go to, to Christine first. Uh, welcome, Christine. Uh, you did something remarkable because you realized kids were not being well fed enough in the United States. We've got a few images uh, to go uh, with uh, this, your story, but tell us how this all began and turned into something enormous. Thank you. Um, well, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of Revolution Foods, and we started about nine years ago. Um, to give you a little idea of our journey, I co-founded Revolution with my, um, my co-founder, Kirsten Toby, and we connected um, because we believed that every child and every family deserved access to healthy, affordable meals on a daily basis. Um, and let me just say, we've got a, uh, a comment up there, the kids, how they're loving the new revolution food yeah. meals. And, um, you know, in, in the United States, about 50 million Americans live in food insecure households. And in the schools and communities that we serve, over 50% of the students we work with will develop type 2 diabetes if the trends continue. So we are in an epidemic, um, and it is preventable. So uh, like many, many entrepreneurs, we started very small, humble roots, six of us preparing, delivering healthy meals to schools um, across the Bay Area where we started. And fast forward nine years, we're serving 1.5 million healthy meals per week across 30 U.S. cities. And oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, the majority of our meals are served to students who rely on school meals as their primary source of nutrition. Um, so these are not optional meals for our students. These are critical meals for our students. 
Um, it's been quite a journey every step of the way. We realized that we needed to start from square one, build a supply chain for real natural food, which didn't exist um, at the price point and volumes that you needed to serve the communities we were focused on. We built seven culinary centers across the country, designed a distribution center to deliver these meals daily. Um, and a big part of what we've done as well is to create good jobs in economically depressed areas. So we are the second fastest growing inner city job creator in the United States right now. Um, we have a team of about 1,500 people who make it possible every day. And we've recently expanded into retail uh, networks, into Walmarts and Safeways, um, so that we can make these affordable meals and healthy meals accessible to families as well as to students. Um, we're on track to be about a $130 million company this year. Um, <clears throat> and um, have worked very hard along the way. And I will say, uh, last but not least, my co-founder and I have also become moms in the journey. So, you know, a big part of what we, uh, we work with every day is learning how to be great parents and great business leaders and manage and balance all of that in the process of building our team. Christy, one million meals a day, where does it go from here? I mean, vast numbers of kids yeah. don't have enough good food and that kind of food that you're serving, where do you go from here? Right, and we think about that every day. We are scaling rapidly, both in schools and um, in grocery stores as well. Uh, but it's not fast enough. And you know, just over, over lunch today, I was talking with another entrepreneur here about scaling globally and how you do that effectively. And so that's on our mind right now because, again, we, we set Revolution Foods up um, not just to serve our local community, but to impact millions and millions of families given the magnitude of the problem and the opportunity. Does the potential to go globally remind you of that day back in the late, to what, 2006, 2007, 2000, 2006. when you were looking in your fridge and saying, <laughs> what am I going to do to help these kids? Well, we knew uh, the minute we started, it was, you know, may have started small, like many um, entrepreneurs, but the demand um, in the U.S., we were getting calls from all over the country, from principals, parents, administrators, saying, we've heard that we can feed our kids healthy, affordable, delicious meals that they'll eat, that will set them up for success in the classroom at a rate that we can afford. Um, so the, the demand was off the charts, and we, uh, in turn, designed the model to really scale as quickly as possible. Christine Richmond, thank you very much indeed. A risk taker joining you this evening. Well done. Thank you. Now, Andrew Fersman, you're rather different. Um, we have um, very different success here uh, in venture capital. Uh, and there you are with uh, some of your fellow venture capitalists in that deeply underprivileged place of Vancouver, <laughs> British Columbia. Um, <laughs> Uh, but we're showing you that because to show the kind of people you are, but also what you're achieving, particularly uh, with uh, not just watching the Pacific every evening, which must be hell as well, but actually also uh, the fact that you've done a lot of work on venture capital uh, and supporting um, PC and IT development. Yeah, I think venture capital is a nice way to put it. We really think of ourselves as an investment club. We, we were originally just a bunch of guys with fairly modest means. And our goal was to be able to get together and take the small amount of money that we had, and instead of popping it into a 0% you know, interest savings account, to be able to look at putting our cash into things that we really wanted to see exist. And so for us, um, looking around the local Canadian uh, economy. There were companies in, um, in fusion, in synthetic biology, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, um, and quantum computing. And really for us the, the idea was let's try and actually you know, band together and if we all put a little bit of money together we can put that into something that really might not succeed if people, you know, someone has to do it. And uh, so that really was what started, we, we called ourselves Minor Capital because we always knew we were going to be the, the smallest check in any of the deals that we were participating Is in. Is that the way it turned out to be? It did. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely. But part of what's been so great is um, we managed to invest in a company called D-Wave uh, just down the street from us in Burnaby. Um, they made the first commercial quantum computing hardware. Um, and 
because we were able to have that perspective of you know, viewing into them from a very early stage, we could see that they were doing really amazing things. And it was from that perspective that we saw you know, we could continue to invest, but if we really wanted to invest and to make these things happen, we could put our time in. So um, one of the minor capital guys and myself co-founded one qubit, which is our software company dedicated to building software for these quantum computers <clears throat> and connecting the power of quantum computation to real world applications, both sort of helping quantum computing build up and uh, find its niche and reaching industry, but also helping real world applications get connected to the power of this hardware that can really transform them. How much of a risk was it, what you were doing? <laughs> I guess only as much as the money we put in. <laughs> <laughs> Did you lose anything? Uh, you know, the nice thing is you've never lost anything until you give up. So, uh, at How this often did you give up? Well, we haven't given up yet. <laughs> I mean, the thing that's great is we started this um, a couple of years ago, probably four or five years now, and all of the companies that we've invested in are still around. Um, the company D-Wave I was just speaking of um, did a great job of really growing very substantially in that time. Um, I've been focused on one qubit where I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO, and we've grown from nothing to uh, much larger than nothing over the last two years. Uh, we now have a, a team of about 30 PhD scientists and researchers working with us trying to put these things together, and we're happy to welcome in groups like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Royal Bank of Scotland as uh, uh, investors in us now, uh, helping us fulfill our dream. And quickly, where do you think you're going in the next year or two? After all, that's a long period for you. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That'll be a whole other lifetime of one qubit. But we'd really like to see as this technology matures, and we believe it's just reaching an inflection point where it's crossing over uh, what's possible with classical machines alone. Um, so we think that this is going to be an excellent opportunity to be able to interface with our partners, who are both our investors and our clients, uh, be able to help them build up the expertise necessary in order to take care of this, and certainly we'd love to be able to see the first applications really paying dividends to the people who believed in us from an early stage. Andrew Fersman, well done. Welcome here. <laughs> right, let's uh, talk to Helen High now, um, uh, who has a remarkable story, not just a goodwill ambassador, Helen, but also what you've achieved, particularly starting in Ethiopia. What have you done there? I came to Ethiopia in 2011. It took me three months from design to investment to actual production. In the following six months, I doubled the export revenue in Ethiopia in the shoe sector. By the end of year one, we recruited 2,000 local workers. By the end of year two, we recruited 4,000 local workers. The question you might be wondering, why did you pick Ethiopia in the first place? The answer is, I did not pick Ethiopia. It was Ethiopia who picked me. And why this, shoes? And then this actually the story started back in March 2011, when the late Prime Minister Meles had a meeting with the chief economist of the World Bank, Professor Justin Lin, Lin Yifu, and asked for his advice in terms of poverty reduction and economic transformation. Justin advised him three things. Number one, job creation, it is the key for poverty reduction. Secondly, the fundamental secret for China in the 1980s and the Asian for Tigers and Japan in the 1960s for their economic transformation because they captured the window of opportunity during industrialization shifting and get into global value chain which created millions of jobs, and that enabled a jump start in their economic transformation. And now, after 30 years golden manufacturing in China, China is moving from a more labor-intensive economy to a more capital-intensive economy. It's about 85 million of the jobs going to be relocated out of China. So this is a golden opportunity for Africa. So the last thing, actually, he advised the Prime Minister of Ethiopia is, how, what are you going to do? He said, you need to create a quick success because that will bring inspiration, leadership, confidence 
to the country and to the continent. Right. And well, let, let's pick up on that confidence for the continent because actually things have developed amazingly quickly in the last three or four years. Uh, let's go to Rwanda and up there uh, we've got uh, the profile of Felix Mohira um, who's uh, <laughs> sent you uh, a, a note on the left and I, I'm in Rwanda. I've been very impressed about your trust to my country. Uh, and he also has written uh, this. Hello, Madam Helen. How are you doing? Tell us the story of him and what was set up in Rwanda as a result of what you did in Ethiopia. Okay, a little bit to finish on the Ethiopia story. Before I came to Ethiopia, Ethiopia have an industrial zone called Eastern Industrial Zone. They struggled five years to attract a single international manufacturer to become a residence. After I created 4,000 of jobs and being asked by the Prime Minister to become the advisor to the government, my first role actually is to promote the first government-owned industrial zone. With less than three months, without any advertisement, all 22 factory units, they all listed out to international manufacturers. Can I persuade you to shift to Rwanda now? Okay. <laughs> And then I know you're here for your <laughs> perseverance, but I've got to persevere too. No problem. <laughs> but it is also the first time. So can we persevere to Rwanda? So after the success, actually, in Ethiopia, which being the successful example <laughs> for Africa, Rwanda, the president of Rwanda came to Helen, me. Helen, your time is going to be up and you will not talk about Rwanda. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have to get you to brief about it after we finish. Can I persuade you to go to Rwanda? So later on, after the success, President of Rwanda, President Senegal, they came to me and then asked for our support in Rwanda. And then this is actually, I've got, I went to Rwanda and this is what we created with less than two months. We hired 500 workers. And then uh, this is actually Rwanda being a small landlocked country. We're taking cottons from Burundi. We're taking textiles from Uganda. Through industrialization, we're exporting the goods to the global market. So we're turning <coughs> Rwanda, a small landlocked country, to a land-connected country because of industrialization. And finally, the potential of what started back in Ethiopia with those shoes and now we're seeing in Rwanda, how can this now be uh, cascaded elsewhere in Africa? The point is, I never approached any president, but you know, it's always the president approach to me, saying, <laughs> Helen, can you help me on the industrialization? And this year, the president of Ghana, president of Ivory Coast, they all follow this path. They all want to do industrialization in Africa. So what I'm saying is, you know, 85 million of the jobs is going to relocate it after China. And most importantly, China lifted out 600 million people out of poverty in the past 30 years. And if Africa can capture this opportunity, there's a huge development impact to this. And there are a couple of other images of uh, what is happening in Rwanda, uh, as well as uh, all of them celebrating and also some of them writing notes to you. Helen, thank you very much indeed and congratulations on what you have achieved. Right, let's now move on uh, to Leslie Mastor, um, who is South African, uh, but now finds himself in Shanghai in uh, Shanghai, but actually we're going to go uh, to Shangtao. I beg your pardon, Leslie. Uh, let's go to Shangtao uh, next, uh, who uh, is uh, an extraordinary oh. entrepreneur, particularly in the IT business. And what we have is uh, a reminder of Jianping.com. There is uh, the graphic which we've got, which uh, is very clear. It's on the website, uh, serving 10 million stores, one billion consumers, and those numbers mm. are rising. Uh, so, uh, Zhang Tao, what about what you do? And we have a screen grab here of the kind of thing on your website. Yeah, start from the beginning was, uh, Dianping was founded 12 years ago, uh, 03. And uh, so we started as, uh, not as exotic as uh, Helen just said, is uh, just from personal interest, because I was uh, myself a foodie, I like to go to restaurants, enjoy the good life. But when I, I was in the U.S. for 10 years, enjoy a lot of good life, but come to, back to China, and uh, you find it very hard to uh, actually find uh, good quality restaurants around, or find it from the media. Uh, they tend to be uh, advertisement uh, sponsored uh, when they do recommendations. So, uh, so I just, just want to find good places. And uh, um, so, um, I combine that uh, with internet. So I think internet is just a place is really good at, you know, uh, just get the reviews, get the feedbacks 
uh, from what the people see on the restaurants. You've been described really, as the Yelp of China. Uh, because I say that now we all call it UGC and everybody know about Yelp. But when we started, Yelp was uh, uh, not there yet. So we started about two years earlier than Yelp. Uh, we are the first company in the world to use this uh, kind of interactive UGC concepts to build uh, really good uh, tools for people to find good life uh, in the world. Um, so that was 2003. And uh, now our vision is really on the page. We really try to move deeper uh, on the business side. So we used to start on a consumer to let people to generate contents and uh, make good choices. But we found that this is not uh, deep enough. Um, for example, uh, we are good at helping people to find a good restaurant, but we are not that good to help people to pick a dish in that restaurant. To do that well, uh, we want to connect uh, our database with every restaurant's database in China. Okay, put their menu digitally, get them online. Uh, so that's the content set. And also, um, in terms of helping the business to uh, do their marketing, to get new customers, to have the customer come back. So we move from like Coupon, uh, another company people are familiar with Groupon, and we actually move beyond that. So we have a new product called Sanhui. It's really a, a kind of using the, the payment, the mobile payment in China, which is, by the way, is, grow incredible. So nowadays, I almost don't use cash and a credit card anymore. I do all my payments through my mobile phone. So where um, are things moving now, do you believe? Where is the trend? Where is disruption taking your business? The trend is uh, several trends. One is uh, really the uh, mobile payment. The mobile payment, offline mobile payment, is growing very fast in China. And that change how we can uh, help the restaurant to do the marketing side. So we are actually combining the mobile payment with the membership and with the deals together, okay, just on the phone. And that's gonna be very transformative. All right, finally, well, I mean, what kind of prediction do you have then as you build the business at amazing speed, given those figures that I just quoted with the handshake there, serving 10 million stores with 1 billion uh, consumers? Where do you think you'll be in a year or two? That's our vision for the 1 billion. So currently, we are serving about 200 million uh, users per month. And uh, we have about... 15 million uh, business listed, and uh, we are working uh, with about a million uh, businesses right now. So there's still a long way to go. Amazing. Well, thank you very much indeed, and congratulations uh, on uh, being here and being recognized thank you. for this achievement. Now, finally, to Leslie, and uh, welcome, because uh, you're from South Africa and uh, uh, with a remarkable background, uh, but you're uh, now working in Shanghai as vice president of the New Development Bank, and perhaps I should just remind people uh, that that's how it all began, um, not, not so long ago, but you're now in Shanghai. Um, what about what you believe you've achieved? Because 30 years ago, you were uh, in South Africa uh, with the ANC and uh, spent a bit of time uh, behind bars because that was the way things were going for the ANC. And you've been through banking, through Goldman Sachs, through Barclays, and through uh, several other incarnations. But here you are now in the PRC uh, for this bank. Um, what about what you've achieved and how you've done it? Thanks very much, uh, Nick. Look, 30 years ago, uh, it's a very long uh, time now, but uh, you know, I grew up uh, under apartheid in South Africa. During those years, in my early and late teens, uh, many of my generation were inspired to get involved in the anti-apartheid struggle. And as it were, in about 1985-86, I was um, uh, arrested alongside uh, you know, thousands of, of people during a state of emergency. Never tried, but, but spent uh, 15 months uh, in prison, and many other people spent several years uh, in prison uh, um, and you know, never having the chance to go to, to a court. Uh, because I think we, we were driven by a desire to remove the social injustices which was represented by the system under which, which we grew up. I do feel very privileged though, Nick, having had the opportunity to then in the early 90s be part of the reconstruction period of the new South Africa. As you know, the, 
organizations like the ANC and others were unbanned in 1990. And I was very fortunate to be part of the, if you like, the engine room of the, of the teams of people who were designing policies for a post-democratic South Africa. Uh, spent a number of years in, uh, in uh, government in a number of roles, and then progressed to spend uh, 13 years in investment banking. But now I have a very unique opportunity to, together with my colleagues, to set up a new in, uh, development bank. And the new development bank is really a startup. And uh, I was joking earlier on that I should be wearing a T-shirt and a jeans like Andrew, because we are a complete startup. We're what would the T-shirt say? <laughs> <laughs> I think the T-shirt would say something to the effect that I'm, I hope we can preserve elements of the excitement of this beginning. Uh, two, three, five, and six years, and maybe even 10 years d down the line. Because right now, all of us have six-year contracts. We, we are here to build this massive new development uh, uh, institution. However, we are starting at a phase where the, the, we are almost overwhelmed by the excitement of doing something fundamentally uh, new. And in, in some ways, I'm hoping that we can preserve elements of the, of the DNA of that, uh, or the secret source of the beginnings of anything. Is it daunting you know. for you? It is quite a daunting uh, process, uh, Nick, because you know, we've got $100 billion of capital that we eventually will need to deploy. Right now, we're a small team of uh, 20 people. Eventually, uh, in three years' time, we'll have a full headquarters here in uh, Shanghai. But our aim is to you know, uh, add to the available pools of capital to build infrastructure in the developing countries in Brazil, in Russia, India, uh, China, uh, and South Africa. And down the road, I think we will become a, if you like, an emerging markets or a bank anchored in emerging markets. Because um, I don't think this is too impolite. I mean, there are banks around the world who are very conservative, who are being told to be more conservative. You've got to take risks. And several development banks do tend to be pretty clunky. Pretty, pretty heavy and slow and deliberative. Since yesterday and today, and also listening to the Premier Lili Kasheng this morning, there's so much talk about uh, innovation. As you know, it's very difficult for large organizations, for large companies to do new things, right? So the fact that we are new, at one level it's a, uh, there's huge responsibility, but it's also a burden because our name is New Development Bank, we will still be New Development Bank in five years' time. So we have to demonstrate our newness by um, going about our business in new ways, uh, and we need to learn from the established institutions. Whilst they've become bureaucratic, I think there's a lot we can learn, but our aim is to go beyond uh, the, the jargon is called best practices because best practices of today can, can, can lead to dead ends uh, tomorrow. We're hoping to design next practices. What should a bank of the future look like in terms of building infrastructure and get rid of the layers of bureaucracy that is typically associated with doing that kind of work. So we want to remain agile and nimble as we grow. We'll hold you to that. Agile and nimble. Do you rec Seriously, do you reckon you can achieve it? I mean, you've, 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 you've been in agile and nimble places uh, also being uh, confronted with some really smart challenges? I have huge hopes that we will be able to, uh, to do that. I think the, the core team led by President K.V. Kamath from, from India has stated as, as a vision that we want to sort of build a bank of the, of the future that's lean, uh, you know, where we get rid of the sort of bureaucracies. And we have young people who are inspiring, who want to do, make a difference in the world to come and work for us. So we're aiming to have a very youthful workforce, have an uh, informal culture, uh, and build an organization that is dramatically new. Do you reckon you can do that in an international bank? There are no great precedents for that. The, there's something which uh, in the book Zero to One is called last mover advantage, Nick. Mm. We, we do have last mover advantage. Okay. All the other banks have been established in the last 70, 60, 50, 40 years. We can learn from them. So, so would you like a bank full of champions? Exactly. <laughs> they're all innovators, they're all risk takers, they're all disruptors. Would you would, like a bank full of disruptors? I would hire probably half of them in this room if they uh, apply. Anyone want to apply? I can't see any hands going up at the moment. Leslie, anyway, congratulations for being here and to all five of you. Well done. We started about 10 minutes late, so we'll finish probably just after half past, but I'd love to engage some of you as well. Louis, could I just have a little more light, please, so I can see faces, certainly at the front. Would anyone else like to come in? We don't want you to feel it's, it's everyone up here talking to you. Anyone else want to come in, uh, please? Um, I can't see any hands going up. Who'd like to help us understand what you've done and, and achieved? 
while you think about it, because I'm not going to let you get away, and we have microphones there. When you, when you listen to your, your colleagues on the platform, what, what's your feeling about how much of what you've achieved is now reflected in the next generation when it comes to risk-taking and understanding it's better to take risks rather than take a, a predictable path in your career? Christian. I think um, for us, risk-taking has been present since day one. Um, we entered a world where there was no solution, in our case, um, to bring healthy, affordable, real food meals to kids in low-income communities and low-income schools in the U.S. So again, just tackling those problems with gusto from how do you build a supply chain from scratch? How do you attract talent um, when you, you don't have much to offer but just a vision and a passion? Um, I've always said you can punch above your weight with regards to recruiting great folks who believe in your mission, um, but there's so, much, there's so much risk there. Um, you know, from a personal and a professional standpoint. All right. Could I get the microphone to Yobi Benjamin? I'm going to pick out a couple of people here, down here. I'll come to you in a moment, Yobi. But again, just picking up on that, <clears throat> do you think risk-taking is now something which the next generation, and we shouldn't be really be talking about generations, this is not ageist at all, yeah. are understanding that there's better opportunity almost than the normal assumptions of work and jobs? Helen. Uh, talking about risk taking, uh, before I come to Africa, I spent 12 years in Europe and then having my executive MBA from the best European school. But if you ask me to compare the entrepreneurship between Europe and China, I would say the following. If you have a tiger in front of you, the Western entrepreneurship will tell you, you get your laptop, you study carefully the correct risk that of the tiger, and then you decide how you're going to jump on top of the tiger to conquer it. But the problem is, once you finish all the study, the tiger might be gone. And then when I return to China, what I learned from the Chinese entrepreneur is, you have a tiger in front of you, you jump on top of the tiger, you ride it. So it's really up to yourself to figure out what is your own entrepreneurship, right. the way of risk taking. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you wanted to work, because obviously, what obstacles are you seeing out there? Yeah. Whether it's in the mindset, or actually in the way people are being encouraged or discouraged? Yeah, well, I think one of the nicest things um, for us was, we felt there was a huge opportunity to do what we did by putting very small amounts of money to work, because the, the uh, orientation toward risk was... I think very poorly managed among most of the investment community um, that was especially locally where we were. But I think this is something around the world where you think the risk that exists in putting your money into something you'd really like to see happen. Uh, I mean, obviously the downside is maybe you lose your investment. But okay. when you think about these, especially these amazing new technologies, these pioneering technologies that are being championed by most of the people here today, the payoff, if these are successful, is massive. And so if you really look at the probability of losing your money and then the payoff that comes at the other end, it's kind of a no-brainer uh, to put your money to work into these things. And I think that that's a, a very underserviced investment opportunity, especially at the very early stage. And yet it's at that very early stage when there's the most opportunity to really change the world by helping people get that first little bit of traction. Zhang Tao, obstacles for you in any way? You've had the most extraordinary uh, development, but have you faced big obstacles too? Uh, obstacles for us always coming from the Could you just sit forward? people. Yeah. It's usually is uh, uh, the talent side. It's usually is the most difficult. Uh, you always find uh, you don't have enough people. You can uh, uh, take the work uh, can be done. And also uh, for us particularly, uh, but we did a kind of transformation. Uh, the, the company we did big change around 2010. But we used to be a more like a, uh, the media content uh, company, and then move to a more transaction company. So that's uh, create a big in terms of ability building and uh, execution abilities. Okay, um, right. Now let's go to uh, your Benjamin. Yeah, welcome. I hope you, we can see you. In, you're in the dark, actually. You're in the dark front row. But tell us about yourself, your company, what you've done as a tech pioneer. Uh, thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Yogi Benjamin. Microphone, please. Uh, try the other mic. Hello. Hi, my name is Yogi Benjamin, 2015 tech pioneer. Uh, my company is named Avigan. I think the most important thing that we bring to, to the table here is a lot of the things that we've done here 
are things that people say, you can't do it. Right. It's impossible. It's not doable. And nobody's ever done it. Actually, I think speaking, I can safely say speaking for everybody here, uh, tech pioneers, um, social entrepreneurs, we all did it. When everybody says you can't do it, that's when we do it. When everybody says you can't get funding for it, we got funding for it. When everybody says you can't ship product, we ship product. And so this is, I think, the inspiration of this entire group. And you know, I can't thank you know, the Schwabs, the World Economic Forum, and everybody else for inspiring not only myself, but everybody, each and everybody here. And thank you very much. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, over there, please. Can we move the microphone quickly? Can we move the microphone quickly? Over there, please. Thank you. Anyone else? Because I've got two microphones. Hopefully, they both work. Anyone else? I'll take three interventions from the floor. Um, Anyone else want to talk about themselves? Please. Hi, um, I'm Saif Kamal. I'm a global shaper from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, we, everyone forgot to mention us, so we're the global shapers. Um, I think our, my company in Bangladesh, we work with early stage social innovations. And as you were saying that it's, people told us that you can't do it, and we have done it, and we're still doing it. But what I would compliment is not just me, but the colleagues of a global shapers community who are here. And these are people under the age of 30 who are making things happen in their country and communities. So I would like you all to give a round of applause to yourself and to my colleagues, please. Thank you. What about, uh, where's Pablo from Ideas in Action? Please, so, yeah. Yeah, that was easy. So I guess uh, I'm from Costa Rica. I'm a 2015 Young Global Leader. Um, one of the things in that topic of innovation is trying to break trade-offs that often pioneers have to do. And I, almost everyone has done one of those. One of this is in emerging markets, investment and risk and learning from failure are not common tools. One thing that I think this community has to improve the state of the world is develop talent very fast. I saw coming in collaboration happen almost instantly. One of the things actually with a YGL that almost never comes to these kind of meetings is most of the time at Carnegie Mellon coding, uh, by 26 he had sold two companies uh, with enough money to not worry about his grandchildren. But I reached out to him and said like, what do we do to really change learning? Let's do a really big partnership where we can take a tool to say, take language learning to up to 100 million people. We'll work on helping the functionality for teachers and stuff where you don't have the patience and time to do it. You help program this at scale and have it for free. And that sense of, you know, innovation requires competing in a way to do something very valuable that someone cannot do. And yet this community has a lot of collaboration and trust. And in my mind, uh, you often think money is what pioneers need and they often think that's what they need, but it's mostly trust. And it's people that are willing to collaborate uh, often on, a, on an act of faith, because you often get very little information, and I think this community has lots of that. Yeah. Great, because what we want to do is work out who the next champions are going to be and what kind of message needs to go from this celebration of you and yourselves. Mark Koska, where are you? Please, Mark, you have a mic. Hi. Tell us about yourself, please. Um, my name is Mark Koska. I'm a social entrepreneur this today, and... Um, very pleased to be here. Uh, my journey started 31 years ago when I read about a predicted problem in healthcare, and sadly it's turned out to be true. The reuse of syringes for medical injections by medical practitioners is actually the ninth biggest cause of death in the world. 1.3 million deaths and 20 million infections of hepatitis every year. So I designed a syringe to, that can only be used once, but it's made on existing machinery for the same price and used uh, without any training. And that is, uh, means that they can't be shared and therefore we stop, stop that problem. We're the biggest supplier to UNICEF and the government of India. We've got 13 licensees, but it wasn't as easy as that because it actually took 17 years to sell the first product into the marketplace, which we sold to UNICEF. Um, and since then things have rolled on and uh, in the immunization space we're, we've had a fantastic success. However, immunization is at less than 10% of the world injections. So the 90%, which we call the curative market, didn't have this push. So I was very fortunate enough to meet uh, Dr. Margaret Chan, who was the uh, DG of the World Health Organization, and, and bend her arm, twist her arm, to put in 
policy for the whole world, which is going to, has now been launched February this year, and we'll be able to uh, complete the cycle by 2020, where every syringe and needle in the world has to be what they call safety engineered to prevent to prevent this. Um, no. I'm not a great team. Just to finish off on the sort of the moral behind this, I'm not a great um, uh, team player. There's only five people in my company and only two people in our charity. But um, it's really trying to coalesce. It's a team in terms of a partnership of getting the supporters around the world. And once they start buying into that, that becomes your motivation to keep going. So, All you. right. Well done, Mark. All right, uh, one more at the back. Can we get the microphone? Anyone else? I can't see. Yeah, there's... Um, remember, these stories are emblematic of everything that you, either individually or together, have and are achieving. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Barker, and I'm a global shaper from Port of Spain. Um, I'm an engineer and entrepreneur, and until recently, I didn't actually know what the term social entrepreneurship meant. Uh, now I do, but I just wanted to, like, just... It's a, it's, a, it's a comment and a call for you guys' thoughts on it, that some of the biggest successes that we're seeing, and especially amongst all of you up there, are that the biggest successes are coming from helping other people, and, um, and that instead of focusing on profit and gain, that just by focusing on helping other people, that's where the biggest uh, successes and so, uh, biggest, biggest successes are going to come from. Um, so I was just curious about your, your comments on that. You're asking a question, are you? <laughs> I just wanted to hear about you, really. <laughs> yeah. OK, well, look, um, I noticed that none of you women in the audience have said, there is a lady at the front. And I am going to just come to you, because um, I chaired a session earlier uh, about robots and the future of gender equality in robots. So I'm in, determined to have gender equality here. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Stand up. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is. My name is Helen T. Hillman from Indonesia. I'm a social entrepreneur in 2015, so the youngest probably. Um, thank you so much, but I have to say that coming here, actually I was scared. I was scared because my work is from one remote island to another. I'm not used to this kind of environment, and I don't know whether I will get something out of it. And I probably, most of the topics it's really, for me, it's like out of the world. But I'm happy to be here. It's amazing that even with out of all my blindness, with all this technological and everything, I found a lot of discussion that gave me a giant leap to what I do. So what I do right now is I'm helping the indigenous community that keep alive the food biodiversity to have a stage in the global market. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I hope we haven't scared you, and I hope you've learned a lot and met a lot of new friends, because this is a big global community. So I hope you're feeling relaxed, and we haven't made it more, more difficult for you tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Right, I'm not going to try and summarize uh, what, what, what's been happening. You'll take away your own uh, conclusions from this. But let me just remind you, this is about vision. Uh, this is about risk-taking, it's about perseverance, the kind of things you've been hearing there, and convening, and adaptability. Of course, there are others who were doing this a long time ago, or have been doing it uh, in the recent decades as well. And let me introduce you to Murat, who's going to come up onto the stage, Murat Sonmez, um, who's from Turkey, um, but he's now a managing director of the World Economic Forum, but we'd have him up here anyway because of the amazing success he generated for himself in Silicon Valley. Murat, welcome. You need to explain what you did and how you've done it and the impact you made, which is actually reminiscent of some of the stories we've been hearing here. Sure. Yeah, thank you. It's a privilege and an honor. Uh, quite humbling to be here, Nick. Uh, we founded a software company in the uh, mid-90s. Uh, we focused on real-time data distribution and when internet was just about to take off and we built trading systems, and a guy named Jeff Bezos knocked on our door and said he wanted to look at clicks in real time and make recommendations, and we did it. Then we adopted the same technology into other sectors like electricity, where in one network we doubled the consumable electricity amount, doubled it without adding generation. They saved $2 billion a year, and the energy we made available is the equivalent of Keystone Pipeline every year, just using software. 
So uh, the company grew, we took it public. Uh, I was the head of operations globally for 60 public quarters. And about a year and a half ago, I had the uh, privilege of uh, being invited to join my colleagues at the forum. And when that happens, you don't say no. It was a question of when. Uh, and I'm happy to be here. Now, I took some lessons during that process, if I may share them for the next ten, uh, one minute. No, not 10 minutes. 10 of them in one minute. So here's the top 10 list. Number one, don't ever, 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 ever give up. So keep going, Andrew. Number two, don't let reality get in the way. It will eventually catch up with you. Number three, don't worry too much about market research because the customers won't know uh, that they don't want something uh, if they haven't seen it before. Uh, people were looking after the faster horses until Carl Benz in 1885 showed us the automobile. So bring the automobile. Number four, in terms of funding, be frugal. Starve your teams of time and money to spend. And that's when the magic of human ingenuity comes out. Number five, there's no better market validation than a customer who's willing to pay you a lot of money right. for a product that you do not yet have. <laughs> if you're looking forward to going uh, uh, for a public offering, IPO, have at least two quarters of a dry run because you, when you go public, you will be faced with the immense pressure of doing the right thing in the long term, but hitting the short term results. Yeah. And the upside is you will get a lot of money to invest and laser sharp focus on quarterly results. Number seven, cannibalize your own products. If you're successful, that means somebody else is right behind you. If you don't cannibalize your own products, somebody else will. Number eight, it applies to here, be social. Talk to as many people as possible, as randomly as possible. Obviously, the best place to do that is at the forum events. The next best place is the airport queues. Stop posting your social status saying, I'm in a queue, talk to the person next to you. I'll give you one example. Uh, two weeks ago, we had some of your colleagues in Geneva with some uh, business executives. And I talked to a guy named Jorge Soto. He's a founder of Data4. It's a micro RNA chip company. He looks at RNAs on a chip to detect cancer early on before you get sick. And I started pushing him and I said, look, what's the ultimate application of this? He said, I need as many samples as possible, as widely as possible for scale. And I said, what's that? He said, toilets. So I, we have a strategic partner called Lixil Corporation, which manufacture, builds toilets. Uh, Fujimoro-san uh, happen, happened to be there. I called him and said, Fujimoro-san, you had been talking about a smart toilet. Here it is. So what they're going to do is they'll put this chip in Fujimoro's toilets, especially in an aging society like Japan, where they will collect samples automatically over a period of time. The toilet will recognize something is wrong and send the data to the doctor for validation. And if the doctor says something is wrong, they will invite the patient before he or she feels any symptoms. So there's no need for samples. The data is there. So smart toilet is coming to Japan. Just random event, just one form event. Number nine, ignore expert advice, including mine. <laughs> and number, <laughs> number 10, finally, I feel like David Letterman. Number 10, if your heart and mind are saying different things, follow your heart. Because your mind will be changed by facts but your passion will pull you through the toughest times. Thank you. Thank you, Marat. <laughs>